Hello everyone, in this video we're going to start talking about invertibility in time series. Now this is probably one of the more confusing concepts in time series analysis, um, but also one of the coolest once you grasp it. So the fundamental idea of invertibility uh, boils down to a connection between the MA, the moving average, and the AR, the autoregressive model. And at first glance, it doesn't seem like there's anything similar about these models because we constructed them in two different ways for two different purposes. And then eventually we put them together into the ARMA model to get the best of both worlds. But even without looking at the ARMA model, there's a fundamental connection just between the AR model and the MA model. And for me, it was really, really cool to learn it, but also pretty confusing and why would that make any sense? So I'm going to hopefully make it make more sense for you guys. We'll start by looking at the math behind it. And then for the intuition to really get that idea ingrained in our heads, we'll look at the causal diagram for why this might make sense. So this first video will be on talking about how a MA1 model or a moving average order one model is really just an AR infinity model. That seems weird, right? Infinite lags, but we'll look at how it makes sense. The second video we'll make after this will be how a R1 model is a MA infinity model. So just switching the orders there. So first I wanna give you an idea of why we even care about invertibility. It's not just some mathy thing that's interesting. It's something that we can actually use in time series. So here's the idea. Let's say that you have some time series, C sub T, and we say that we're gonna model it using an MA1 model. Remember, an MA1 model is just saying that it's going to be a function of the random error or innovation from one period ago, which is epsilon t minus 1. And then it's going to also be a function, of course, of the random error or innovation today, which is unobserved, which is epsilon sub t. I put a negative sign here just so the math works out a little bit easier. But the point is that this phi is the coefficient of the random error or innovation from one period ago. Now, this is a great model. We've talked about the intuition behind this MA1 model, but the difficulty is in actually executing it. Let's say I'm trying to make a prediction of C of T, C sub T for the next day. Now, using this function, I would have to plug in the random error or innovation from today or yesterday or whatever the time period one ago was. But I don't really have this epsilon tub sub T series. All I have is the C sub T series. So I have uh, C1, C2, all of the C values up until today, let's say, but I don't explicitly have this epsilon sub t series. So how do I actually plug anything in and get a prediction out of this function? That's the difficulty. Well, let's do some transformations using the lag operator that we learned and see if we can transform this equation into an equation using the c values in the past instead. Let's get started. So the first thing I'll do is use the lag operator to uh, rewrite this right-hand side of the equation as 1 minus phi lag, and you can think of the one exponent here if you would like, epsilon sub t. Now I can divide both sides by this quantity, which is how I get c sub t over 1 minus this phi l equals epsilon sub t. Now here is the part that maybe is a little bit confusing, but this right here, so uh, actually, you see how this is c sub t over 1 minus phi l? So that's really 1 over 1 minus phi l times c sub t, right? That's the same thing that's here. This thing right here you'll recognize as an infinite geometric sum. So if you go back to your geometry textbooks or algebra textbooks probably, and you look at what's the formula for an infinite geometric sum, it's going to be this, where the common ratio between the terms is this thing right here, this phi l. Some of you are probably cringing a little bit because this L is an operator. It's not a number. So why am I allowed to do this? Um, this is an operator, and this is all shorthand that we're using here. But if you were to do it the long way, you would find that this is indeed um, how this works out. So we have 1 over 1 minus phi times L. So the common ratio is phi L. Of course, there is a restriction here. Uh, we need the common ratio's absolute value to be less than 1 because a geometric series only converges if each term is um, progressively smaller in absolute value. It'll diverge if they're bigger and bigger, obviously. So we require that we require that phi is less than 1 for this all to work out. We'll come back to that in a second. So that's why I'm allowed to write this as 1 plus phi sub L plus phi squared, L squared, and this infinite sum right here. That's where that comes from. I still have this C sub T, and I have epsilon sub T. Now I'm going to take this lag operator and break it up. So I'm going to just take this c sub t and apply it against the lag operator every single time. So I'm going to get c sub t, so that's from here. I'm going to get uh, phi, and then I have l applied to c sub t, so that becomes c sub t minus 1. 
and I get all of this infinite series of c sub t minus k. So now we're starting to see where this ar infinite bit comes in, because this is just an ar infinite series. The last thing I'm going to do is move everything over to the right hand side except c sub t. So I have c sub t is equal to some coefficient times c sub t minus 1, some coefficient times c sub t minus 2, another coefficient times c sub t minus 3, and it's just going to go on forever. And then I have also the random error or innovation from today. Okay, it looks like I made everything really complicated because I went from this really nice elegant little equation into this giant massive mess, right? But if you take a step back and look at what this giant massive mess actually contains. It basically says that my time series today is a function of the lags of my time series yesterday, two periods ago, three periods ago, and infinite periods ago. So at first glance, it still seems like this is kind of unusable, right? Because how can I plug in infinite lags if I only have a finite time series? But the brilliant part comes in when we see that the thing that's getting multiplied by c sub t minus k is phi to the power of k. And remember we said that phi is in absolute value less than 1, which means phi to the power of k is a progressively smaller, smaller, smaller number. So in uh, using this in a real world setting, we can kind of just shut off this whole series after a certain amount of lags because they're going to be zero at that point because the thing they're getting multiplied by is so puny. So that's why this formulation of the MA1 model is more usable than the MA1 model itself because this only takes into account values of the time series at previous time periods. Nowhere do you see this epsilon sub t minus 1. So we never have to plug in these um, innovations from the past. So that's why this thing, which is a AR infinity model, is more usable than the MA1 model it came from. Now, when I first learned this, and the second time I learned this, and the third time I tried to look over it, it was still confusing because the math was fine, it works out, but in my head, it just didn't make sense. Like, what do you mean an MA1 model is an AR infinity model? How does that make any sense? Something that helped me was looking at the causal diagram and seeing why we can represent something that looks like this as something that ends up looking like this. So if we look at this first equation, we see that c sub t is a function of epsilon sub t minus 1 and epsilon sub t. So that's what the arrows here represent. Now let's see if we can derive how c sub t could also potentially be a function of c sub t minus 1 and c sub t minus 2 and all these infinite c lagged values. To do that, let's first uh, take this equation and do t minus 1 instead. So this becomes a t minus 2 and this becomes a t minus 1. Basically, if we rearrange that equation a little bit, we're going to find that epsilon sub t minus 1 is a function of epsilon sub t minus 2 and c t minus 1. So epsilon, c, uh, epsilon sub t minus 1 is a function of c t minus 1 and epsilon sub t minus 2. So that's what these arrows represent. Just going back further and further in time, we're going to find that epsilon sub t minus 2 is a function of c sub t minus 2, epsilon t minus 3, and then this just goes further and further and further. So basically, we can take this initial formulation, which said that c sub t is a function of these two guys, and we can just go down the chain, we can go down this um, kind of function or causal chain, whatever you want to call it, and we can show also that c sub t is a function of still epsilon sub t, and epsilon sub t minus 1, which is in turn a function of this, and this, which is in turn a function of c sub t minus 2, which is a function of c sub t minus 3. So we can say equivalently that c sub t is a function of epsilon sub t, c sub t minus 1, c sub t minus 2, c sub t minus 3, and just the infinite c sub t lags going further and further and further into the past. So if you study this causal chain, you can show and prove to yourself that this first formulation, which is the MA1 formulation, is the same thing as this last formulation, which is the AR infinity formulation. So that's why an MA1 model is equivalent to an AR infinity model if this phi is less than 1 in absolute value. And if it is less than 1 in absolute value, we can go through this whole process and we call the time series invertible. So I wanted to give that definition at the end because it really doesn't help too much in understanding this idea. But once we have understood the idea, I can just put a label on it and say that everything we talked about means the time series is invertible. Okay, so hopefully that helped to start understanding the idea of invertibility. In the next video, we'll just turn the tables and we'll talk about how a AR1 model is the same thing as a MA infinity model. All right, so until next time.